Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Korea Society. My name is Luce Lanzot, and tonight is the final talk of this year's K-pop 101 series, uh, the highly anticipated gender politics of K-pop. We are delighted to have two wonderful speakers here with us tonight, and I will introduce them briefly before we begin. Dr. S. Heijin Lee is assistant professor at New York University, focusing on transnational feminist cultural studies, Asian American studies, gender and sexuality studies, digital media, and popular culture. Dr. Lee's research explores the imperial roots of culture and media. In addition to her book, The Geopolitics of Beauty, which maps plastic surgery in South Korea, Asia, and Asian America, Lee is also co-editing two anthologies, including other pop uh, her works include Other Pop Empires, Bollywood to Hollywood, and Fashion and Beauty in the Time of Asia, which tracks fashion and beauty as formations of Asian modernities. Lai Francis is a freelance journalist and producer whose work has been featured in Billboard, Allure, Pop Crush, K-Pop Stars, The Boombox, and many more media outlets. A self-proclaimed K-Pop girl group enthusiast, Lai can be found on panels at KCON, New York Comic Con, also contributing to podcasts and digital products, uh, projects on arts, entertainment, and culture. Please give a warm welcome to our speakers. <laughs> so before we dive into the questions, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself and why you decided to work in the field that you do, uh, academia and in journalism. Uh, Dr. Lee? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, when I started my graduate studies, K-pop wasn't a thing like it is now. So it wasn't like I started being like, I'm going to get a PhD and, and become an expert on K-pop. And um, I, there's no way I could have foreseen that. But but what was on my mind at the time, so this is the early 2000s, let me date myself now, um, was all the discourse around Korean plastic surgery, right? That was that was present. Um, and it was really all these articles about Korean women are getting so much plastic surgery and they really want to look white. And at the most basic, simple level as a Korean American, I was like, that's not anything that I've ever heard, right? I never had like a cousin or an aunt or anyone be like, I want to look white. I'm going to go get plastic surgery. Um, so I started sort of down that that road and um you know and then as the years progressed we kind of entered into this moment where korea you know started using cultural products um as a global export and as a way to brand itself as a soft power mechanism and really you see the sort of intersection between beauty and k-pop and that's really how i came to study what i study Bye. so for me um i guess you could thank the internet to where I am right now, thanks to Tumblr, thanks to YouTube, uh, scumble, uh, scrambled upon Girls' Generation on YouTube, and I just got sucked in. I mean, I, and then with Tumblr, I was always a blogger. I always loved talking about music, sharing what I would discover. And then, yeah, with K-pop, it was when 20, 2008, um, I was in middle school, graduating into, uh, high, getting into high school. And then there, I wanted to talk about K-pop more. I was talking about Girls' Generation, new releases, Shiny, Dongbang uh, Shinki, Super Junior, Big Bang, 21, like all the second mm -hmm. ge generation K-pop groups. And I told myself, once I got into college, I was like, I, I want to break the stereotype of med medicine, taking medicine or anything in that field. And I wanted to do media. I wanted to talk about me. There was I wanted to show more representation of what the a Asians could do. So yeah, that's what that's how I got here. Thank you. So before we dive into contemporary, could you characterize traditional notions uh, of femininity and masculinity or gender roles? Mm, when I got into K-pop, it was given that the, the first music video I saw was Girls' Generations Kissing You, and that was very cutesy. Uh, and that was a concept. And until 21 came around and it was very um, badass, that image. So it gave me that that K-pop is very flexible to do two concepts. Um, and it was very catchy and, and glamorous, high production quality um, material. And that's what I'd say would define how K-pop is now. And then as years go by, you have a groups like twice who could and red velvet who is very flexible to both concepts um given they're they're such big groups under the big three yeah 
Dr. Lee? Yeah. yeah, I would echo that, but I think it's funny when you said traditional, I thought you meant like, you know, traditional Korean culture. Yeah, if you, if you <laughs> could give, give us, us a little background. Traditional <laughs> oh, I thought it meant K-pop. K-pop. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, I actually, I don't like to, you know, do the sort of like essentialize, like this is what femininity was like, or this is what masculinity was like. Um, but I think some of the things that we all recognize is the sort of, you know, the patriarchal, heteropatriarchal um, man who is sort of macho and, um, I think that holds true whether it's in the U.S. or in Korea, um, and femininity is soft. And so I think you know the the way that these images relate is that in early K-pop, you really have, and this is what Lai is talking about, these two sorts of brands of femininity. Um, Girls' Generation is you know the sort of more innocent, um, cute. Um, very long-legged, as we see here. Um, <laughs> and then uh, 21 is the sort of rebellious version of that. Um, they're much more in your face, uh, wearing, you know, Purring. I wouldn't say whatever they want, but, you know, a little bit more outrageous than, than the girls. Um, but in both, both representations, it's, it's still this, like, limited way of being feminine, right? You still have to be beautiful. That's the thing, right? You can be, uh, you can wear, you know, a feather vest and, and, and ripped jeans, but you still have to be um, sort of uphold the standard of beauty. And so I think we start there. Um, but what's interesting over time as we sort of go through these images is I think we're at a moment now where the representations are much more um, diverse. You're starting to see a little bit more a movement. Um, and I think that what's interesting is that I, I think men had a little bit more flexibility from this moment, this sort of earlier K-pop moment until now. Um, but in the last couple of years, I think you see more diversity with what how women are represented. Um, and one thing I'd like to talk about later is how that might be sort of linking up to the Me Too movement in Korea um, and some of the other feminist um, movements there. But but yeah, I think this is this is definitely sort of the the standard, right? That we all know, gener girls' generation in twenty one. So you mentioned that until recently, <clears throat> when we see more diverse girl group or female artist concepts, the male artists kind of have more freedom. Could you give us some examples of the different expectations or limitations that male artists may face, as opposed to female artists? Yeah, I, so you know, I don't want to I don't want to overstate, right? This like you know, that they have so much more freedom, um, particularly in the ways that we know that K-pop artists can be sort of locked into certain contracts and expectations. But I do think that there was much more versatility in masculinity, right? Like, you know, the sort of beast-like masculinity that we all expect, you know, rip your shirt off and you're super ripped, right? But then you turn around and you're um, doing fan service and like, you know, kissing your boy band mate and being very soft and playful. And there's a way that I think that you know, Korean media especially, right, utilizes all of these different modes in different media circuits, right? So if you're on a game show, you're being like playful and obnoxious, sort of like the the cute kawaii masculinity. Um, and then you're on stage and you're ripping your shirt off, right? And so I think there's just more of a, of a range that um, masculine representations uh, could entail um, that I think, you know, we didn't see so much with the female artists. Two groups that come to mind when you <clears throat> said that were 2PM. They're probably the most masculine group I've seen um, when I became a fan. And then there was Super Junior, who has Hicho, who has, um, you know, just dresses up in drag, but as for fun and stuff. But it comes to the point where, like you said, fan service, where he would just go on stage during this one tour and then he would kiss like Shiwon or like whoever the uh, drummer was at that time. I think it was, I believe it was Henry. And it's, 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 too, it's very fluid <laughs> to, to how they tackle it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lee, you mentioned plastic surgery. So what role does plastic surgery play in the lives of these artists? And are there different standards of beauty for male and females? Oh my gosh. Can we even talk about K-pop without talking about plastic surgery? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Yeah, so I'm in my work, I'm really interested in how right through these artists, you know, Korea has come to brand itself as this kind of image of 
of modernity, right? Capitalist modernity. And it all sort of takes place on, on, on these bodies that we, you know, love to watch, right? We can't stop watching them. Um, and it's, it's interesting. I was doing an interview in, in Korea with the Seoul Tourism Board for their medical tourism industry. And their cosmetic surgery market is their largest market. And the representative I was speaking to was saying, you know, we don't really spend that much money on advertising. Um, Hallyu, K-pop is our, our advertising, which if you really think about it, is shocking, right? You have, a, you have a cosmetic surgery market and you don't have to spend that much money advertising, right? But it's obviously because you have this whole successful pop culture industry. And so what's fascinating to me is how you can track over time how these gendered bodies, right? I want to say women's bodies, but it's also, of course, m male bodies, um, become these advertisements or symbols, images of, of Korean modernity, of beauty, of the sort of aspirational life. Um, and, it, and it changes over time the, the way that it's represented. And it has to, right? Because it's a, an industry. So it has to keep us interested. Um, so, you know, if, you, if we look at these images, it's, it's really the sort of sleek representation of, of beauty, right? I mean, I think it's you know, really obvious that, you know, um, a lot of work sort of goes into looking like that um, or having legs that long. It's kind of amazing. <laughs> um, but, you know, it changes over time. Um, this is uh, Brown Eyed Girls. They did a SNL digital short called Plastic Face. Do you guys remember this? Anyone? Yeah. It was around 2014, I think. And, and it's meant to be a funny sort of in-your-face production that they did on uh, Korea SNL. And it's to the tune of Lady Gaga's um, poker face, but p -p plastic face. Oh, yeah. I won't sing I it for you guys. I remember this now. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. But, you know, there's like the shift from this moment where beauty is, uh, you know, so I, I'm, just much more tame, right? You see it through Girls' Generation, this sort of like innocent beauty um, and then we sort of switched to this moment where getting plastic surgery is almost like an F you, right? Like it can be a kind of, um, you know, it, it's, you see the, the women artists claiming it much more, right? And, and sort of wearing it as a badge of honor, as like a, a sort of almost like a feminist practice to say F you to the men who are criticizing them. Um, and in this video, you know, they go so far as to show their sort of like before picture, um, you know, which people didn't do before this as much, um, you know, pose with their, their surgeon. Um, yeah, you know, and then, you know, and then walk around, you know, the, the translation is we are so confident. Um, and then lastly, a literal, you know, F you, right? And so it's interesting the way that, right, beauty gets synced up to this kind of rebelliousness, um, almost, you know, like saying that plastic surgery, investing in yourself becomes a kind of feminist practice, right? And so that's, that's really interesting to me, the sort of transition that you see. Um, and how does plastic surgery get sold through K-pop, through these representations, even when it's, you know, sometimes obvious and sometimes not, um, and again, in this video, they talk about the ways in which, uh, you know, a lot of male artists also have plastic surgery, but, but, but it doesn't get as talked about, right? And so I think it's prevalent, you know, for both men and women in the industry. So we talked about how K-pop artists can reinforce gender stereotypes. So on the other hand, how do they defy, aside from, you know, SNL, how do they defy these stereotypes in your, in your mind? I feel like K-pop artists, hmm, I think fan service takes a big portion of that. Um, you see uh, members interact with each other, and um, I guess this could also touch base on, like, LGBTQ issues as well. When artists, like, you know, with hand-holding or just some type of skinship, like, it's very, fans or, or their audience make it very exclusive. That's how... Um, the changes I've personally seen um, as a fan and into a professional, I could see how it affects uh, the the masses that they touch. So for me, I think fan service takes a big part of that. Do you guys know what skinship is? Yeah. Skinship. It's like, well, so like um, touch of a hand or like, let's say I put my arm around her or like um, hug 
it's yeah, yeah. physical physical affection, yeah, affection to to <clears throat> to say in k-pop terms or like korean terms yeah so i'd say that's how it whatever fan cams are being uh fan cams from concerts or like from outside activities that artists do behind the camera like if if fans catch that moment i feel like the way that it's marketed when it's published out there whoever consumes that information it it translates to something different to whoever's viewing it yeah yeah i think picking up on that um Fan service is an interesting phenomenon too, not just in the sense that we see sort of, you know, these representations, even if they're manufactured for the fans of sort of same sex uh, physical affection, right? There is a sort of resistant reading that you can do of what the fans are doing, right? That in cultures where women are supposed to be preoccupied with heterosexual romance and getting married and becoming a wife, right? There is this sort of subversive element of being preoccupied with watching two guys kiss, right? That like what you're seeking is not for the idol to want you, right? I mean, although those subtexts obviously exist, yeah, yeah. but what is sort of satisfying you in that moment is watching, you know, their skinship, their affection, their intimacy. So I think, you know, that's an interesting um, other roadway where, you know, female fans are sort of finding a different way of, of um, being fans that maybe are, is outside of that sort of heterosexual norm. And so co-ed groups used to be pretty common back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and they're making a comeback. Uh, Card, which Card is a co-ed group. I recommend them. Uh, they're more popular, you know, outside of Korea uh, than in yeah. Korea, which is another interesting phenomenon. Um, and sadly, Triple H is no more for now. Oh, we can all shed a tear for Triple H. Um, so do you, do you think that this co-ed formula will be more common in the future would you like to see more co-ed groups yeah of course you know when when card came out the first group i thought of in the western uh the western market was 18s i don't know if you guys remember 18s years ago um but they were pretty popular as well but i feel like card has could carry that and they set a um, example for incoming k-pop groups to be more open for code groups and, and collaborate more. And we also see that with, with SM Station. Um, SM Station has gathered some, some of their artists um, within the label to release music, whether it's monthly, I believe, and they've made um, an album out of it and music videos too. Um, also with just labels, you know, they have their own concerts uh, yearly. I hope that JYP doesn't... Uh, a, 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 another tour soon because their artists are, are booming as well. Um, they collaborate with their stages and their performances, whether it's a year a year end stages or at concerts. So there is so much potential. It's just if I feel like if fans were just more open minded to having that marketed to them and presented to them, I think it'll all be a better place. <laughs> it's all up to you guys. Yeah. So yeah, an example of that SM station, I believe Wendy from Red Velvet, she did a song with John Legend. Yeah, John Legend, yes. So that was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then now it's uh three members of NCT with uh Red Velvet Thierry are is are coming out with a, a song. So, I mean, it's possible and it's already garnering attention even um when it, it's not out yet. It's just been teased. And you talked about the fan reaction to having kind of their faves interact with someone of the opposite sex. And so we, yeah. we've seen a backlash with Hyuna and, and Idan from Cube Entertainment. Um, just quick backstory. They were on the same label. Hyuna was with Wonder Girls and then 4 Minute. And then she was a solo artist. And they'd been dating for two years in secret. And after they revealed that they were dating, you know, there was a huge backlash by fans because you know, no, they're supposed to be available for me. You know, that's, there's a real sense of entitlement that uh, many fans feel. Uh, and so they, and they recently officially were let go from their company. Uh, and I, I thought it was a real missed opportunity. I mentioned this last week, you know, to change that culture uh, where, you know, the artists have more agency over their lives. Uh, because right now it seems like, you know, they're kind of slaves to their fans and what their fans want. And I think it crosses the line sometimes into unhealthy, you know, expectations. However, I think they are changing the face. I mean, it's already showing that they're changing the face of K-pop and how 
the audience and fans and everyone should just uh, accept relationships, whether they're on screen or just like friends or outside of it, if they are a couple or not. Um, it, um, what was I going to say? But they are, as, as you can see with Kyona's and Edon's Instagram, I think they're taking that opportunity to, you know, maybe they'll start a label, maybe they'll start their own projects, but they're pushing it. Not, not just them being a co-ed duo, but them as a couple. They're showing that this could happen and we could still get the support. And a lot of it, you could see with the likes and the comments that they get on social media. So it's amazing how, though they, you know, they have lost some fans or they, they're not, they don't have a label behind them. They have enough popularity and fame to change the game. So it's good to see that. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's the sort of double-edged sword of what's amazing about K-pop, right, is that fan labor, that fan love um, also creates wild demands on the stars, right? But, I mean, what other fan group can you think of that, you know, what was it, like BTS, they raised like a million dollars in like, I don't know, it was like two minutes, not not really two minutes, but in like the, <laughs> the shortest amount of time, right, because fans will go to such great lengths to, you know, really do anything for these these idols, um, you know, donate money, uh, subtitle things, right? All, all kinds of unpaid labor. Um, so it creates this really interesting interactive fandom that I think is so unique to K-pop. Um, and so artists are constantly in conversation with their fans in terms of their music, their style, and then, of course, you know, unfortunately also their love lives and <laughs> personal lives. But I agree. I've seen a lot of support for Hyuna on her Instagram. She's oh, posting yeah. so many cute videos of them dancing and dancing together. And I think they probably gained a whole yeah. slew of new fans that wouldn't have even thought about K-pop. We can give her that promo now. So go follow Hyuna on Instagram yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> and Edon too. He just opened an Instagram last Not week. Paid. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... K-pop, uh, like K-pop, is recognized as a sanctuary for many different demographics. It's kind yes. of a subculture, and many people identify it as like a lifesaver, you know, something they can turn to in dark times. Um, so, how would you say that K-pop has become a safe space for members of the LGBTQ community? Um, this goes back to what I was saying. Uh, I discovered K-pop through Tumblr, uh, through YouTube, but also I've talked about it through Tumblr. And Tumblr sp space was very uh, LGBTQ friendly, so. A lot of the things I would see or I've shared is like a lot of, you know, ships or uh, that they're being shipped. Ships are being shipped. Do you guys know what like, ships are? Yeah. Ships are just pretty much couples. So like, let's say we take V or Jungkook. It's called V Cook. That's the ship of the BTS ship. <laughs> okay. So, but like, so um, <laughs> it's, it's like I'm talking on a, a Tumblr platform right now. <laughs> uh, so it's pretty much the fan service again. We're bringing out fan service and skinship because it goes hand in hand, mm -hmm. and it serves to the mark uh, to their fans that like, oh my god, they're so cute together. And um, to that, I feel like it relates to whoever the youth is, like who the youth, whoever's viewing it. Because sometimes when we look into Western media, especially Western cult, uh, the fans, young fans. There's not enough representative, represent, Asian representation, to say the least, in media for us to relate to someone who is of the LGBTQ community. So if, let's say, some people would probably turn to K-pop and see such little skinship such as that, they would be like, oh, this is something I could kind of relate to. Uh, uh, and I feel like one day I could have that type of love or have that type of friendship with someone. That's how I'm viewing it. That's um, one way I look at it. So um, I'd say it definitely goes with how K-pop very markets uh, markets themselves when it they pair each other up with um, members or like other members of the same sex. So that's how I'm seeing it. And that's something that labels consciously do when they're selecting the members. So when you see groups that debut, those aren't all the people that were training for years. You know, there are people that got that didn't make the cut. Um, and the labels will think about how the chemistry between different members will be attractive to fans. Yeah. It's, it's um, one group uh, that I could, well, Girls' Generation is one of them. 
um, because they say Taeyeon and Tiffany have been have such a good uh, long background being friends. And when Tiffany went to well, the backstory is that Tiffany uh, stayed with Taeyeon during their training days, trainee days, and so a lot of fans when they debuted they called them Tiny, right? Yes, Tiny. And then now that you have like a group like Twice, who is Nayeon and Jonghyun, who are the two oldest members of the group, uh, who have trained together, uh, they call them uh, Tuyeon. So it's it's pretty it's it's fun, but it could get toxic along the way. Yeah. Yeah, Do you want to? Yeah, I think what's interesting about K-pop, what's been so fascinating, is you know with any sort of cultural form. The producers or the industry, you know, has one intention for what it's going to look like and feel like and how it will be received. And then how it's actually received is a whole nother story, right? All these sort of unintended consequences that are very different depending on where you go. Um, and so I think, you know, Lai and I were talking earlier about this sort of current moment where there's, you know, some new queer representations um, in K-pop, but even far before that, before there was any sort of intentional queer representation in K-pop, right, you had, like, fans in Thailand, for example, um, you know, doing cover dances, uh, you know, the... Oh, I think I have a slide. Oh, yeah, you do. I do, right? (laughs) It's not a great picture, but the Wonder Gays, right? Um, They're a Thai cover cover dance group, and they started their own whole career in Thailand, right? Just doing Girls' Generation cover dances, um, Wonder Girls. Um, And it creates this whole subculture for for gay men in Thailand, right? This sort of like safe space, refuge. um, And the same is true in Mexico, right? It's like a a huge, huge uh, cover dance scene for gay men in Mexico as well, right? So the sort of way that K-pop has become an LGBTQ refuge for many, many years, um, I think, you know, in, in many instances, despite the intentions of the producers, right? That's not really what they had intended, but here we are. So who would you identify as trailblazers that are breaking boundaries in K-pop, pushing the envelope? Uh, we both talked about this earlier. I'd say Holland, Holland, um, Amber. When it comes to the female, um, yeah, Holland's definitely the top contender. Uh, being the an independent artist who is uh, openly gay in the K-pop community, independent artist who has done everything to himself, whether it's producing the music video, his own music. Uh, raising money for his own. He's funding himself, and it says a lot. No matter how much backlash that he gets, he still produces music to change the game. And it's amazing to see how much publicity he's getting uh, in the Western market. Mm -hmm. I've... All I remember is, like, papers covering, billboards coming, like, a lot of uh, of, uh, media outlets are are, are covering him just because he is the first openly gay K-pop artist. And uh, that, to me, is he's definitely a, the number one trailblazer. And then you have someone, um, Amber Liu uh, of FX, who is andro- androgynous, breaking the stereotype of being the cutesy, long hair, skirt, dressy idol, who has a buzz cut, piercings, tattoos, just a total badass. Uh, so I would definitely, those are two top two contenders for me. Let's talk about this video. This music video is so good. first of all, he. Well, I mean, I don't know if you've uh, seen uh, Holland's first music video, um, which which was Neverland. Uh, he, it was a very subtle music video, but he still kisses a guy. However, this music video is very, very. I'd say very. It's very bold, very different, very refreshing. The way it's shot, it's very westernized too because you have different cultures a different uh people of color in the music video and you have drag queens in it and you just see holland making out with with uh, his mans so it's <laughs> it's i'd say it's one of the top music videos that defy the change in k-pop this year yeah it's great i just want to underscore that that point, right? I mean, just the queer element of the video, but having people of color in a K-pop music video is yeah, fantastic. It's not right? a lot it's, we get to see that representation. Yeah, yeah. So. so I think that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so Hyuna not only is known now for this whole dating scandal, but she's also known for kind of pushing the envelope of what oh. you know female 
artists are allowed to be. And it's interesting because even with the cutesy girl concepts, like there's always an undertone of like sexualizing, right? Yeah. But you know, when when female artists such as Hana want to, you know, use their sexuality as part of their presentation, it's looked down upon. So how how do you see her fitting in this conversation? With Hana, I think she she is marketing herself real well. Like she's sexualizing it, but she's more of a, she's more like teasing it. She's like, uh uh uh, this is not I may be showing all of this, but that's just me. That's just for me. That's for the I, I do have my boundaries too. Um, I'm just amazed at how like she's very open to the way she performs. I mean, uh, there's a viral clip that went around Twitter and Instagram of her just carrying her boobs. There's just like, you know, just perking up her boobs. And that, um, you know, people sexualize that. But at the same time, a lot of females or girls that I've seen are praising her just for just being so open out there and just celebrating her body and uh, it's just being who she is and without the label just, you know, coaching her and telling her what to do. She was just very bold. So. She, she, I think she once, like, took her shirt off yeah, right? she, at a yeah, performance. She, yeah. she performed in a bra the same, the same and performance. everyone was, like, freaking out. Yeah, it's like, you off. know, male idols take their shirts off all the time. Yeah. Like, so it's interesting double standard. Yeah. yeah, and there's also, I think you could also even say Sunmi, too. Sunmi is, like, a great contender to change with the image of how females should act and uh, fem- females are in the k-pop industry i mean she has her song gashina which is very very bold saying um that she she is fine on her own that she doesn't really need anyone and then um dating back to a few years ago there was also miss a rp who's like one of the greatest groups that, girl groups i like who came out with a song called i don't need a man so, I mean, though that song has gotten backlash for just saying that lyric, it also tells tells us that, you know, that there are changes that they want to push that it's just frowned upon. It's so sad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sort of picking up on that, we were talking about, where is it? Which one? Uh, what is love? Oh, that was before. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that one. this one. So we were talking about this this music video, um, what is love? And you're saying, right, this lyric, like, I don't need a man. And so I think this interesting moment where we're starting to see more representations of female artists, as you know, I was refer- referencing earlier, yeah. where it's not always about the dude, right? Like, I don't need a man. And in this music video, it's fascinating because they're rehashing famous scenes of Hollywood movies. I'm sure you guys have seen it. Um, but they play all the parts, right? There's no, there's no men in these scenes, and yet you, you, you know, can fully sort of be in that moment with them. Um, but I was just really struck by like how there doesn't need to be any dudes in in the video, um, and I feel like that's an interesting trend that we're seeing. I mean, we could talk about this music video all day. I, I personally. I personally think this is one of the top music videos of the year, considering the different topics you could dive into, considering they're the top girl group of Korea right now. And the fact that the way this music video is marketed, they are in ships and they the girls are playing male roles. So it opens it is an open topic to the conversation that we were talking about. So I also like just to go back to Sunmi. I really appreciate her as well because she seems so kind of quirky and yes. she really lets her fun, you know, funny yeah. side out. And it's like you know, she doesn't seem like she's trying to fit into a role. She seems like she's, she's being a free herself. spirit, and that's that's so attractive. And that's something like that sincerity is something that really draws me to certain certain artists for sure. I'd be friends with her. Hopefully she's watching this. On me, I'd like to be friends with you. <laughs> um, did you want to talk about any of the other music videos that we have here? I have. I do have a question about the Me Too movement in Korea as well. Mm, so a bunch of these music videos, um, I mean, we could start with What is Love. Um, I already mentioned that. I am very amazed uh, because they only do not touch base into like Hollywood movies, but there are, there's a, Korean film in there too, um, which was I believe was called uh, First Love. So this is the actual scene, uh, Ji Hyo and Jong Hyun. Uh, but there are some. T- I, I'm just amazed at how this was shot. That I believe the girls and the directors themselves uh, themselves chose the pairings. 
uh, and then actually there was a scene uh, with Sana and Jonghyun, which they are re they're reenacting a scene from the movie Ghost, and the behind the scenes, the dir- the producer and the director said, "We're pairing you two because in the music video that came after this, which was Heartshaker, Heartshaker, Sana goes in for a kiss to Jonghyun, but Jonghyun refuses. Sana, like she pulls back, pulls away, and that was." Um, unintentionally in the music video i believe and so they said that scene caught a lot of attention so they paired them up in this music video so it's amazing how they're mark they're marketing the the group um there are also other music videos in here um with k will which was uh, oh this is luna chu which is a very this music video came out this year and this talked about an innocent uh crush on a same sex so it's not even uh, out there, it's just showing that you know there's such such things as just having a small crush or being curious. Um, and then there's also K Will's music video. Uh, of course, we talked about Holland. Oh, history. Um, and this is yeah, K Will's music video. Uh, this is about uh, a couple who's about to get married, and then their best friend um, is supporting uh, the couple. However, the friend is in love with the. Uh, groom to be spoiler yeah spoiler sorry <laughs> <laughs> you can you can <laughs> so so yeah it's a it shows that there there are it's so sad that society does work that way or like how we cover up ourselves so it's just one of the many stories that individuals face uh, especially in korea which where it's such a conservative country um, yeah, this one is just cool because it plays on your expectations. I mean, you you think you have that K-pop formula down. You know, he's just pissed because his friend got the girl. Um, and then in the in the car scene that you see right there, it's always her in the in the passenger seat until the very end. And so I think it really plays on sort of your view as the viewer, like your expectations as the viewer. Um, you know, and then it switches at at the very end. And yeah. I believe the last music video, this slide, this is a new music video that was released a few months ago by an artist called Tenny. And the storyline is just two two females, two females fighting for their love. They're very out with it. However, they are hiding it from their parents. Um, and it just so happens they do get caught and, you know, they... They disown them, banish them from their home, but they still fight for it. Eventually, even though with the circumstances, it's more of them just going out there and believing themselves that they could do it. So this was a very refreshing take because it's not a lot that you see girl-on-girl music videos um, out there to represent the female audience. I was a little confused about the end. Oh, really? Like, I was I was kind of confused at the end. Right? Yeah. Okay. Like, was it just maybe me? maybe we should just email the label. <laughs> <laughs> so um, some some artists have faced backlash. I believe one of the Red Velvet members like was take was a photo was taken of her with like a feminist book. Oh, you know, Irene. and there was yeah Irene right, and there yeah. was backlash against it. Could you talk a little bit about you know feminism in Korea, the Me Too movement? And then recently, um, there was a K hip hop artist San E that was wrote this terrible song so (laughs) could you talk a little bit about the the movement currently in korea yeah i mean i think in korea you know as here the me too movement has caught fire um and is really being led by a new sort of younger generation of of feminists um and so it's interesting to see how that's reflected in in k-pop i think one of the things you see right i mean K-pop is all about the commodification of difference, right? We have to sort of see new images and new types of idols. And so on the one hand, when I see these kinds of images, you know, it's exciting because it's new representation and it's representation of groups that are, of course, previously marginalized. But on the other hand, I'm always a little bit wary, right? Because as an industry, it's always seeking to make more money and more money, right? So to commodify the next image, the next um, kind of person. Um, and so I think, you know, so so with the sort of exciting things that are happening in Korea around feminism, um, 
you know, I wonder if some of these representations are also a way of sort of harnessing that energy, um, having it be reflected in the industry um, and to sort of make some money on it. On the other hand, you know, as you're saying, right, we see backlash when K-pop stars are merely holding a book, right? That the the book is um Parshibinian saying, right? Um Kim Jiung, the the novel, which was like, you know, people were saying it was a feminist novel. Um, and she she wasn't holding it, she said she read it, right? And people I think burned pictures of her. Right. And so, you know, it's it's interesting because it's not like she went to a protest. Or, right, like, she just said she read a book, right? And so you see this kind of backlash, uh, I think, against K-pop stars, particularly because we hold them up as these sort of ideals of, of um, femininity, right? They, they are the sort of first bastion of the kind of good, good girl-ness that we expect um, in everyday life. Um, and then, of course, right, more recently, we've all heard about the the escape the corset movement, which, you know, I think is all a part of what's happening in Korea and people um, throwing away their makeup and sort of refusing to do the labor that Korean women have had to do, but actually all women, right? It's not just Korean women. Um, but for the, for the first time you see in a really visible way over social media, this move to um, make visible what women are saying has been previously invisible, right? We spend so much money, we spend so much time, we spend so much energy, and we're not going to do it anymore. Um, I think the important thing, though, is to circle back and to, to recognize that these feminist threads have always existed, right? This the Escape the Corset movement is not the first feminist movement around beauty in Korea. Um, Korean Women Link, for instance, did many campaigns around loving your body and, you know, no diet, no plastic surgery. So um, I think, but this is like an interesting new iteration that, you know, even if we don't live in Korea or go to Korea, we can all sort of relate to because it's happening here as well um, in a different way. So how can we follow you in the future if, they want, if the audience wants to learn more? How can they get in touch with you or are there any projects that you're working on? Yes, uh, I am currently working on a documentary uh, series. Um, it's called The Hollywood Wave. It's an ongoing uh, in-process, uh, pre-production process right now. Um, it's going to be a, s- a six-episode series talking about the different branches of Hollywood Wave. Um, it's about K-pop, movies, entertainment, esports, um, anything that makes up uh, anything that's Hollywood. Um, and as for me, if you'd like to get in contact with me, this is the self-promo uh, portion. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, uh, Live Francis, L-A-I-F-R-N-C-S. So that's on Instagram and Twitter. And yeah, I hope to see you guys there. <laughs> Dr. Lee. I am currently working on a book on the plastic surgery industry and how it intersects with uh Korea's pop culture industry um, that sort of tracks plastic surgery in South Korea from the end of the Korean War to the present moment. Uh, That will be forthcoming soon, I hope. Um, I'm currently teaching at NYU, so unlike Lai, who has, you know, the, the Twitter handles ready, I'm a boring professor, you can find me on the NYU website. (laughs) (laughs) I'll log on to it. I'll read it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. She's gonna send you me. an email through your board or something. Uh, and I if anyone, email. Yeah. I'm not that boring. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's interested in following me, you can find me on Twitter at kpop underscore historian. You can see me fanning about my favorite groups and randomly ranting about social justice. Um, there is another event on December 15th at 5 p.m. Uh, hosted by Open Forum New York. There's a flyer at the front desk, and we're going to be answering the question: Why are Americans so crazy about K-pop. Um, are you going to be joining us? Maybe I'll be there. So Dr. Lee is going to be joining us. So um, I believe we will have some journalists from Billboard as well. So we're going to be discussing what makes K-pop so appealing to Americans. Um, so thank you to our speakers. Let's give them a round of applause. Um, too for having us and everyone at Korea Society. We, we are going to be enjoying some beverages and Korean food in our gallery, so please uh, join us there. And uh, please fill out the, uh, the survey form so you can help us improve our programs in the future. Uh, but thank you all so much.
Hi, mom. <laughs> Hi, friends. <laughs>